Section two of the Song of Hiawatha. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Song of Hiawatha by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Section two. The Four Winds. Honor be to Mujekiwis, cried the warriors, cried the old men, when he came in triumph homeward with the sacred belt of wampum. From the region of the north wind, from the kingdom of Wabasso, from the land of the white rabbit. He had stolen the belt of wampum from the neck of Mishemokwa, from the great bear of the mountains, from the terror of the nations, as he lay asleep and cumbrous on the summit of the mountains, like a rock with mosses on it, spotted brown and grey with mosses. Silently he stole upon him, till the red nails of the monster almost touched him, almost scarred him, till the hot breath of his nostrils warmed the hands of Mujikiwis, as he drew the belt of wampum over the round ears that heard not, over the small eyes that saw not, over the long nose and nostrils, the black muffle of the nostrils, out of which the heavy breathing warmed the hands of Mujikiwis. Then he swung aloft his war-club, shouted loud and long his war-cry, smote the mighty Mishemokwa in the middle of the forehead, right between the eyes he smote him. With the heavy blow bewildered rose the great bear of the mountains, but his knees beneath him trembled, and he whimpered like a woman, as he reeled and staggered forward, as he sat upon his haunches. And the mighty Mujikiwis, standing fearlessly before him, taunted him in loud derision, spake disdainfully in this wise. Hark you, bear, you are a coward, and no brave as you pretended, else you would not cry and whimper like a miserable woman. Bear, you know our tribes are hostile, long have been at war together. Now you find that we are strongest, you go sneaking in the forest, you go hiding in the mountains. Had you conquered me in battle, not a groan would I have uttered, but you, bear, sit here, and whimper, and disgrace your tribe by crying like a wretched Shogodaya, like a cowardly old woman. Then again he raised his war-club, smote again the Mishemokwa in the middle of his forehead, broke his skull, as ice is broken when one goes to fish in winter. Thus was slain the Mishemokwa, he the great bear of the mountains, he the terror of the nations. Honour be to Mujikiwis, with a shout exclaimed the people, Honour be to Mujikiwis, henceforth he shall be the west wind, and hereafter and for ever shall he hold supreme dominion over all the winds of heaven. Call him no more Mujikiwis, call him Kabayun, the west wind. Thus was Mujikiwis, chosen father of the winds of heaven. For himself he kept the west wind, gave the others to his children. Unto Weybun gave the east wind, gave the south to Shawandasi, and the north wind, wild and cruel, to the fierce Kabibonoka. Young and beautiful was Weybun, he it was who brought the morning, he it was whose silver arrows chased the dark, o'er hill and valley. He it was whose cheeks were painted with the brightest streaks of crimson, and whose voice awoke the village, called the deer, and called the hunter. Lonely in the sky was Weybun, though the birds sang gaily to him, though the wild flowers of the meadow filled the air with odours for him, though the forests and the rivers sang and shouted at his coming, still his heart was sad within him for he was alone in heaven. But one morning, gazing earthward while the village still was sleeping, and the fog lay on the river like a ghost that goes at sunrise, he beheld a maiden walking all alone upon a meadow, gathering water-flags and rushes by a river in the meadow. Every morning, gazing earthward, still the first thing he beheld there was her blue eyes looking at him, two blue lakes among the rushes, and he loved the lonely maiden, who thus waited for his coming, for they both were solitary, she on earth and he in heaven. And he wooed her with caresses, wooed her with his smile of sunshine, with his flattering words he wooed her, with his sighing and his singing. 
gentlest whispers in the branches, softest music, sweetest odours, till he drew her to his bosom, folded in his robes of crimson, till into a star he changed her, trembling still upon his bosom. And for ever in the heavens they are seen together walking, Waben and the Waben Annung, Waben and the Star of Morning. But the fierce Kebibonokka had his dwelling among icebergs in the everlasting snowdrifts, in the kingdom of Wabasso, in the land of the white rabbit. He it was whose hand in autumn painted all the trees with scarlet, stained the leaves with red and yellow. He it was who sent the snowflake sifting, hissing through the forest, froze the ponds, the lakes, the rivers, drove the loon and seagull southward, drove the cormorant and curlew to their nests of sedge and sea-tang in the realms of Shawandasi. Once the fierce Kabibonokka issued from his lodge of snowdrifts, from his home among the icebergs, and his hair with snow besprinkled streamed behind him like a river, like a black and wintry river, as he howled and hurried southward over frozen lakes and moorlands. There, among the reeds and rushes, found he Shingebis, the diver, trailing strings of fish behind him, o'er the frozen fens and moorlands, lingering still among the moorlands, though his tribe had long departed to the land of Shawandasi. Cried the fierce Kabibonaka, Who is this that dares to brave me, dares to stay in my dominions when the Wawa has departed, when the wild goose has gone southward and the heron, the Shushuga, long ago departed southward? I will go into his wigwam, I will put his smouldering fire out. And at night Kabibonaka to the lodge came wild and wailing, heaped the snow in drifts about it shouted down into the smoke-flue, shook the lodge-poles in his fury, flapped the curtain of the doorway. Shingebis the diver feared not, Shingebis the diver cared not. Four great logs had he for firewood, one for each moon of the winter, and for food the fishes served him. By his blazing fire he sat there, warm and merry, eating, laughing, singing, O Kabibonokka, you are but my fellow mortal. Then Kabibonokka entered, and though Shingebis the diver felt his presence by the coldness, felt his icy breath upon him, still he did not cease his singing, still he did not leave his laughing, only turned the log a little, only made the fire burn brighter, made the sparks fly up the smoke flue. From Kabibonokka's forehead, from his snow-besprinkled tresses, Drops of sweat fell fast and heavy, making dints upon the ashes, as upon the eaves of lodges, as from drooping boughs of hemlock, drips the melting snow in springtime, making hollows in the snowdrifts. Till at last he rose, defeated, could not bear the heat and laughter, could not bear the merry singing, but rushed headlong through the doorway, stamped upon the crusted snowdrifts, stamped upon the lakes and rivers, made the snow upon them harder, made the ice upon them thicker, challenged Shingebis the diver to come forth and wrestle with him, to come forth and wrestle naked on the frozen fens and moorlands. Forth went Shingebis the diver, wrestled all night with the north wind, wrestled naked on the moorlands with the fierce Kabibonokka, till his panting breath grew fainter, till his frozen grasp grew feebler till he reeled and staggered backward, and retreated, baffled, beaten, to the kingdom of Wabasso, to the land of the white rabbit. Hearing still the gusty laughter, hearing Shingebis the diver, singing, O oh, Kabibonokka, you are but my fellow mortal. Shawandasi, fat and lazy, had his dwelling far to southward, in the drowsy, dreamy sunshine, in the never-ending summer. He it was who sent the wood-birds, sent the robin, the opechi, sent the bluebird, the owaisa, sent the shawshaw, sent the swallow, sent the wild goose, wawa, northward, sent the melons and tobacco, and the grapes in purple clusters. From his pipe the smoke ascending filled the sky with haze and vapour, 
filled the air with dreamy softness, gave a twinkle to the water, touched the rugged hills with smoothness, brought the tender Indian summer to the melancholy northland in the dreary moon of snowshoes. Listless, careless Shawandasi, in his life he had one shadow, in his heart one sorrow had he. Once, as he was gazing northward far away upon a prairie, he beheld a maiden standing, saw a tall and slender maiden all alone upon a prairie. Brightest green were all her garments, and her hair was like the sunshine. Day by day he gazed upon her, day by day he sighed with passion, day by day his heart within him grew more hot with love and longing for the maid with yellow tresses. But he was too fat and lazy to bestir himself and woo her, yes, too indolent and easy to pursue her and persuade her. So he only gazed upon her, only sat and sighed with passion for the maiden of the prairie. Till one morning, looking northward, he beheld her yellow tresses, changed and covered o'er with whiteness, covered as with whitest snowflakes. Ah, my brother from the Northland, from the kingdom of Wabasso, from the land of the white rabbit, you have stolen the maiden from me, you have laid your hand upon her, you have wooed and won my maiden with your stories of the Northland. Thus the wretched Shawandasi breathed into the air his sorrow, and the south wind o'er the prairie wandered warm with sighs of passion, with the sighs of Shawandasi till the air seemed full of snowflakes, full of thistle-down the prairie, and the maid with hair like sunshine vanished from his sight for ever. Never more did Shawandasi see the maid with yellow tresses. Poor deluded Shawandasi, t'was no woman that you gazed at, t'was no maiden that you sighed for, t'was the prairie dandelion, that through all the dreamy summer you had gazed at with such longing, you had sighed for with such passion, and had puffed away for ever, blown into the air with sighing, ah, deluded Shawandasi. Thus the four winds were divided, thus the sons of Mujikiwis had their stations in the heavens, at the corners of the heavens. For himself the west wind only kept the mighty Mujikiwis. End of section two.